Well, aortic stenosis is the process where the heart valve leaflets tend to harden, calcify, and they don't open up very well. And as a result, there's a very narrow hole through which the blood has to travel in order to get out of the heart to the rest of the body. As a result of that, there's a backup of pressures related to the attempt to at trying to pass through that small hole. So when the heart requires more output, due to things like exercise, the heart isn't able to meet those demands. And as a result, symptoms develop. Now this process of hardening of the valve uh, is often due to the age process of just simple wear and tear, degeneration over time. Unfortunately, there's really no other treatment for aortic stenosis and preventing that downward decline in, in, in mortality other than surgery. Medication has never been shown to work. So for the longest time, all we had was surgery. Unfortunately though, since aortic stenosis is a disease of the elderly, a lot of the people who have gotten to this point in time are too old or have too many comorbidities to be considered for good surgical candidates. And that's why the transcatheter aortic valve replacement, or TAVR, has really given these people a new option. Um, the bottom line is that in the past, when an individual had a severely narrowed valve, uh, the only real alternative was medical management if the patient was too sick for a therapy or a very high-risk surgical procedure. Now there's an option to go ahead and treat them with a less invasive approach that may be uh, either life-saving or life-improving in uh, a great uh, many of the, those individuals. I noticed in the latter about the past year that uh, I'd have breathing problems, uh, endurance problems. Yeah, well, I'd already been seen a cardiologist and he um, it started uh, about two years ago and uh, he knew because of my medical situation that uh, my words but that uh, open heart surgery was probably not the route and he said that uh, your his almost quote was is uh, you're in a race against time just a terrific medical care that I've gotten from Dr. Needleman and all of the the many terrific people I've met here at uh, Holy Cross Hospital, which I'm eternally grateful for. Uh, Holy Cross is one of a handful of p places in the United States that now can do this procedure. The procedure takes place in a special room. Holy Cross uh, decided early on to become involved with this work and planned uh, over a two, two and a half year period uh, prior to our doing this to build an inter and a hybrid OR which is utilized to do all sorts of, of procedures but it was built specifically for the uh, trans aortic valve replacement procedures. The patients require a full workup uh, prior to getting to the operating room to determine whether they're candidates for the procedure. Uh, so there's a team of three uh, interventional cardiologists, one of which has structural heart experience, um, and two cardiothoracic surgeons that evaluate the patient uh, to help determine whether they're a candidate for the procedure. Uh, in the procedure, their uh, physicians get involved uh, in different aspects. There's a cardiac anesthesiologist that helps maintain the patient's hemodynamics. There are cardiothoracic surgeons that are there uh, in case their expertise is needed. Uh, there are two implanting uh, interventional cardiologists uh, that are needed for the procedure. Uh, and so we, we have a large team here that are participate as designated at the beginning of the procedure. The surgeons and the cardiologists have uh, gone to a, a number of meetings, uh, both locally, nationally, and internationally, uh, to become totally up to date on uh, the indications for the procedure, the type of patients, uh, how the product works, etc. Then as the team came together, we did a lot of the educational activities together so that we'd have a lot of interchange amongst ourselves about how we were going to look at each different part of it and who was going to do what role and, and uh, how we would put it all together, bringing all the different skill sets uh, into the room but in a coordinated way. 
echocardiography plays a very, very important role. Of course, before we get to the OR, uh, we have to screen patients with uh, echocardiograms as well to determine whether they have a meat selection criteria. The second role of echocardiography is procedural guidance, where we help the surgeon and the interventional cardiologist in various aspects of the procedure, whether it's guiding them and advising them as to the passage of wires and devices across a very tight calcified aortic valve, guidance over the ballooning of the device before positioning and deployment of the artificial valve, the TAVR. We are able to go across the aortic valve with a guide wire this guide wire allows this to slide a balloon across the aortic valve. Now the first step is to open up that hole a little bit to make some room. We open up the valve, we expand it a little bit with the balloon. That valve comes crimped onto a balloon. Once we get it in the proper place and we verify that place location by several different ways, we then are, are ready to expand the uh, valve. The valve comes uh, as leaflets attached within, it, within a stent and that stent gets pushed open up against the walls of the, uh, of the native valve. Uh, we stop the heart. We do that by pacing the heart at a very rapid rate, somewhere between 180 to 200 beats per minute. Typically a normal heart rate is 60 to 80 beats per minute, and we tend to pace the heart at around 200 beats per minute. And so although it would seem as though the heart was working harder, when you pace somebody's heart and make their heart beat 200 beats per minute, there's not enough time for the heart to fill with blood, and so when it squeezes, no blood comes out. Uh, so what ends up happening is when we have the valve in the aortic position uh, and we pace the heart at 200 beats per minute, uh, there is no cumulative, no effective blood flow out of the heart, uh, and so it causes the heart valve that we're trying to position to move less because there is no blood being ejected out of the heart, and so that allows for more accurate positioning. Uh, of the heart valve prior to deployment. And it allows us to be precise in where the valve is implanted. So that's probably the most important part of the whole procedure. There's no leeway in where the valve goes in um, and you can't get it back. So it has to be done, uh, it has to be put in in the exact spot that you want it to. Uh, we keep pacing after the valve's been implanted. We remove the balloon from the valve before we start the heart working again and then start the heart back up. It's remarkable to watch the process uh, to see somebody whose heart valve doesn't move and then you insert the new valve on top of it and suddenly everything works just like it should. Uh, it's really quite amazing to see it happen so quickly. Uh, in the first case that we did, uh, the heart function increased almost three times from the uh, way it was before the heart valve implantation to right afterwards. Within 30 to 40 minutes, his uh, heart function had increased by a factor of three. It was quite amazing. The second access site that was allowed by the FDA and by Medicare is the apical area, which is basically a three, two to three inch incision uh, between the ribs, uh, just below the uh, breast line. And uh, that gets us right to the tip of the heart. And we can pass the valve in uh, through a little hole made in the tip of the heart. Very recently, the uh, government has also approved uh, two other methods of doing this. So we have a lot of options now. And basically, there, this would make it that there's no patient that doesn't have an anatomical pathway to get the valve in. And after the procedure is done, there's an after part, which is follow-up. So we follow these patients with uh, cardiac ultrasound to make sure that things continue to behave and uh, remain stable as they were uh, when they came out of the hospital. So all we're doing right now is replacing the same valve we would otherwise replace surgically. We're putting it in with a much less invasive method uh, with the use of catheters. It is pretty exciting. It's actually... Um, a very revolutionary idea, and we'll change the whole process by which we deal with this, uh, this, this type of disease. But the revolutionary part about it is not just about the procedure itself, but it's about the whole method in which we go about doing this procedure. This is not just about one doctor doing this. This is about a whole team of doctors doing it. We do it in a whole revolutionary new area called the hybrid OR. 
because we are introducing a whole new approach to how we deal with this. In the, in the span of my 30 years of interventional cardiology, I've had the opportunity to be involved with two of the transformational aspects of cardiology. First being angioplasty and now uh, what we call trans catheter aortic valve uh, replacement. And I predict certainly within uh, the rest of the span of my career, this technique will become the way that patients get their aortic valve replacements as long as no other valves need to be involved. I hate to get folksy, but it was loving care. I could tell uh, the, the nurses and the uh, various technicians and the specialists and the, the uh, all came by to visit me right after the procedure and then throughout my stay here. And as you've just seen, uh, it's a friendship that will continue. But the results are all not just in the procedure results, but in seeing these people afterwards and how they're actually functioning better. And they've done tremendously better. They're now walking distances that they, weren't, when they were not able to walk before, do activities that they couldn't do before. And that to me is the most gratifying part quality of life.